I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5 is our text uh, for today for the series that we're in, Character 101. Uh, and so uh, I just encourage you to turn there. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 1158 and you will find Galatians chapter 5. You'll be able to follow along in our text for the day. And as always, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you because we want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know that if you do that, then God will change your life. Uh, so I'm going to invite you to, uh, to think back to school. Think back to when you were in school. Some of you, that's a longer journey than others. And when you were in school, what was your least favorite subject? What was that class that you despised attending the most, that you just, your heart sank, you're like, oh, I have to get up and go to? Okay, so I want you to take a moment, and I want you to share that with your neighbors, your friends, people around you. Okay, what was your most despised class in school. If you're a teacher present, don't be offended. Please, you know, it's not directed at any people, just at subjects that we didn't like taking. It's a lot of laughter. It's good to hear you healing from your pain. Uh, so when I was in school, the, the class I liked the least was science uh, and uh, and especially chemistry. I finished and passed chemistry still believing that a mole was a furry little creature that lived in the ground. If you didn't get that joke, you know less about chemistry than me. So we're in the midst of our Character 101 series uh, where we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit that's found in Galatians chapter 5, our text for today and for this entire series, the text that we're hoping that you memorize and, and uh, just so that those, those characteristics that God wants to teach us are, are fresh in our minds and our hearts all the time. And uh, the subject of today's study is one that probably is many of our least favorite fruit of the Spirit. So uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things as these, there is no law. And today we're talking about patience. Love, joy, peace, patience. So we're talking about patience because we all just love patience. And because uh, I'm guessing it's in the top two least favorite fruit of the Spirit, if I just went through that list, uh, patience and self-control are probably right there neck and neck for the ones that we really don't want to embrace. But the truth is, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then God is committed to teaching you patience. God is committed to teaching you patience whether you want to learn it or not. It's core curriculum in the study of the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christ follower, this is not an elective. You can't opt out and say, yeah, I want all of them but patience. And, and through the years, I've heard many well-intended Christians say things uh, that, you know, really aren't biblical, like this one. And uh, Maybe you've heard someone say it. Maybe you've said it. Hey, you don't want to pray for patience because if you pray for patience, then there's going to be all kinds of trials in your life. I've heard people say that. I've heard people recommend that. Oh, I'm not going to pray for patience. No. And the reality is you have trials in your life. You're going to have them whether you pray for patience or not. Trials are part of life. And, and, and so you might as well learn patience. And you might as well learn it now. Might as well embrace the, the lessons that God is teaching. Because in school, if you didn't pass a subject, if you didn't pass a grade, what did you have the privilege of doing? Yeah, you got to take it again. And summer school is so wonderful, right? Because we all want to go, hey, in college, I paid for this class once, I'm going to pay for it again. Because that's a good use of funds right there. No, uh, you know, here's the thing. We might as well embrace the lesson that God is teaching because if we don't embrace it, we get to repeat it. We get to repeat it. In fact, if you ever feel stuck in your spiritual life, 
You ever feel like you've hit a wall, you're not growing, you're not able to, to really you know, make progress and you're thinking, what's wrong with God? It may be that you are not learning what he wants to teach you, that you are rejecting the lesson that God has for you. And, and so, you know, if, if you embrace that, you'll move on. Because a lot of us are just there in the same classroom over and over and over again, not learning what God is wanting to teach us. And, and, and so it's wiser to be an eager student ready to embrace the Holy Spirit's instruction because God is committed to teaching you patience. Are you committed to learning patience? See, we need to learn patience because impatience results from selfishness. Impatience results from selfishness. Now, we want to blame our impatience on all kinds of things, don't we? Well, you know, I, I lose my temper because I'm Italian, I'm German, I'm Irish, I'm Mexican, I'm Scottish. It's not my fault. I can't keep my, you know, I, I'm going to lose my temper because I'm a redhead. You know, we want to blame it on our genetics. We want to blame it on our heritage. And the truth is that we are impatient because we are selfish. And we are selfish because we are sinners. And that applies to all of us. The Bible says, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. All means all, everyone. The Bible says there's no one righteous, not even one. So because we're sinners, we're selfish, and our impatience comes from our selfishness. You see, I want the world to conform to my expectations, my desires on my time schedule, and when it doesn't happen, I get upset. That's selfishness. I want for me on my schedule. And if you want to get technical, impatience is idolatry because when we are impatient, we are usually putting ourselves at the center of the universe. Who belongs at the center of the universe? God. Yeah, it's Jesus that we ought to be thinking of, and yet when we're impatient, we're thinking of self and not him. And it happens to all of us in different ways. I don't, I don't know what ways affect you. Driving is my worst, Okay. I just confess that I want to go where I want to go when I want to get there. I don't want anybody in my way. I, I love people who drive faster than me. I get out of their way uh, for both of you. And, uh, and yet it's going to happen every week at some time, you know, driving up the hill towards the Sweetwater campus from downtown. There's going to be two people who, um, whether intentionally or cluelessly, match speeds below the speed limit going up the hill. And I'm going to be behind them praying for them. <laughs> well, see, I have to pray for them because beating your head against the steering wheel doesn't work. And, and why should I think that the world should, you know, accommodate my standards and my speed uh, because of me? And so when, you know, people get in front of me and go drive slow, I just pray for them because it's a whole lot more redemptive than yelling at my car. Uh, Please don't drive slow in front of me, so I'll pray for you. I'll just pray for you if you ask, okay? <laughs> but, but it manifests in so many ways. Think about it. When you walk into a restaurant, we are so spoiled in Havasu, right? Because we walk into a restaurant, what do we expect? To be seated immediately. They're going to have a table. Hey, look, I grew up in Phoenix. I was used to waiting in a restaurant, you know, Friday night. Tw only 20-minute wait? Awesome. Here, I walk into a restaurant, 20-minute wait? I'm going to go someplace else. Why? Because I'm impatient. You know, or maybe some of you are this way. You get seated in a restaurant, but you have to track who was seated when and who gets their food when. And if somebody gets their food out of order because it's not happening the way you think the world should function on your time schedule and your way, it's not fair and you're going to melt down and lose it because you're impatient. You're selfish. We do stuff like that. Or what about with our spouse, our kids, our family? They're not doing what you want, acting how you want, being who you want them to be. So you express your displeasure, your anger, your frustration. It's impatience. And by the way, selfishness is really ugly when we see it for what it is. And we can blame it on other people, but it's us. And selfishness is destructive when we live it out fully. So we are impatient out of selfishness. Therefore, being impatient is being ungodly. We need to understand this. We just read that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is patience. And so when you are patient, it is evident that God is in your life and he's working in your life to develop his character in your life. 
Think about it. Jesus said the great commandment is what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. 1 John chapter 4, uh, verses 7 and 8 says this. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born from God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, describes love in these words. And a lot of you know this. He says, love is patient, love is kind, it is not envy, does not boast, is not rude, is not proud. Think about that. The very first characteristic of love that God uses to tell us what love looks like is patient. Love is patient. So let me ask you this. Do you love your spouse? <laughs> wow, I didn't know that was a hard question. <laughs> Let's try this again. Do you love your spouse? Yes. You know, I really thought that you guys would be more enthusiastic because they're sitting next to you. I thought, here's your moment to shine. I'm, pastor says, you love your spouse? Whether anybody answers or not, I figured some of you guys would be going, yes! Like your team just scored a touchdown or something. You missed that. Just pointing out. Do you love your kids? Yes. Always less enthusiastic. Hey, wait, this one's an easy one. Do you love your grandkids? Yes. Oh, yeah. That's the loudest one every service. Uh, Really not fair, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Are you, pa no, you don't have to confess this one out loud either, okay? Are you patient with your spouse? No. Thank you for confessing out loud. Some of you didn't want to get into a fight, so you just said, I'll just say it now. They're sitting next to me, so there's no way I'm going to say yes. Uh, are you patient with your children? I'm not going to ask if you're patient with your grandkids because I, I know the answer. But uh, see, here's the thing. We say that we love our family. We, we say it emphatically. We're, we're adamant that we do. And yet a lot of us, whether verbally, out loud just a moment ago or inside, cringe because we're like, no, I'm not patient. So who's wrong, us or God? Because God says love is patient. And we want to be you know, people who represent Jesus. Uh, we say we're followers of Christ, and at Calvary, uh, we value character because we, we believe you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And, and by the way, that starts at home. Please don't, you know, bottle it in and be patient with all the people out in the world because you go, I can't yell and scream at them, and then go home and be impatient with your family. This starts in the home. Jesus wants to be there in your midst. And, and the people that you love the most, be the most patient with. It's going to bless them. It's going to bless you. It's going to change the dynamic of your family in beautiful ways as the character of Christ is developed in you in that place that matters the most. You see, we want to be people who pursue patience, who ask God to teach us patience, who who. Allow him to build this attribute in us that we admire but don't often want. You see, we need to learn patience because God builds character through patient endurance. God builds character through patient endurance. Uh, James chapter 1. I invite you to turn over there in your Bibles. Uh, it's page 1199 if you have one of the Bibles from the, the seats. Uh, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. I'm going to read this to you, but I want you to take this one home, and I want you to read it this week sometime, uh, maybe tonight, maybe later on, and just allow this to marinate in your soul, because these are, these are verses that explain so much about what God is doing in our life and how God wants to redeem us. James says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete Lacking in nothing. Um, by the way, the word steadfastness, we don't use it a whole lot. In other translations, it is translated perseverance, endurance, and patience. In other words, God uses trials and difficulties to develop maturity in his children, to make us complete, to grow us up as his kids. 
And, and so these are tests of faith designed to produce endurance and perseverance and steadfastness and patience in our lives. And we grow up as we pass the tests. So how are you doing with the tests of patience in your life? Let's go back to school for a moment. How many of you liked taking tests in school? <laughs> There's a few hands that went up. When I raised my hand there, I, what I mean is, I'm not talking about you'd prefer to take tests over writing a paper. How many of you would rather take a test and write a paper? Yeah, see, a lot of hands go up because you're like me, you're lazy. And um, it's like, get it over with, pass, fail, I'm done. I don't have to spend that much time. But I'm talking about, given a choice of no test or taking a test, how many of you would actually take a test? Yeah, there's a few hands that went up. You are the people that keep the Facebook quizzes, you know, going, functioning. <laughs> hey, I really wonder, what kind of spirit animal am I? Uh, so, uh, don't ask your friends, because they'll tell you. Uh, but, uh, but here's the thing. Why do they give tests in school? They give you a test in school so that you can prove that you've learned the material, that you understand it, that you've mastered it, so you can move on to the next level of the same subject. Uh, so, you know, but, but it's to prove that you've learned it. And so let's be honest. If I went to a class and they said, hey, there aren't any tests in here, all you have to do is show up uh, and you pass. Look, I'm not going to read the book. I'm not going to take notes. I'm going to show up. I'm going to sit there. I might listen if he's interesting. I might not. And, and uh, pass the class. But if that professor says, hey, there's going to be a quiz on what you read the night before, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to read the book. If there's a test, I'm going to study for the test because I want to pass. Actually, I want to do better than pass. I want to excel. But there's a test to hold me accountable, and I'm going to study because there's a test. Right now, would you give yourself a passing grade for patience? Would Jesus give you a passing grade for patience? See, I'm assuming that we'd all like to pass the test, so let's look at practical patience. Practical patience. I, I, you know, we want to grow in patience. We, we want to be people who represent Jesus. So what are some practical steps we can take in the midst of life's challenges? Because, you know, we're, we're not doing as well as we'd like. We'd like God to help us do better. So here are, again, habits that we build into our life that will help us to grow in patience. But if you're doing these things, it's, it's likely that you're embracing the teaching that God wants to give you. So the first thing is, if you want more patience, you need to rejoice. You need to rejoice. James says it, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Rejoice. Seriously, does God want us to rejoice when life is hard? Yes. Actually, he tells us to rejoice always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. We need to practice rejoicing. Uh, it, it means that we want to rejoice in God's blessings, that we stop and we identify on a regular basis God's blessings in our lives and recognize how God has poured out grace on your life. That's what it means to rejoice, to think about the things that God has done. And it begins with salvation, because for everyone in here who's a follower of Jesus Christ, it, it means that Jesus has, in, has invaded our world and offered himself as a sacrifice for your sins. That he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. That his blood wiped them away and forgave you of all that you've ever done wrong. All that you ever will do wrong. And that now you have a place promised for you in heaven even though you deserve to go to hell. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, that's the good news of the gospel. And it's why you ought to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Because we deserve hell, but we get heaven. That is good news, and we ought to rejoice in that even if we've got nothing else good in our life. That alone is worth rejoicing in. But let's be honest, there is so much more that we can rejoice in. We can rejoice in our family, and I know your family's crazy, my family's crazy. It's okay, we're sinners. All families are crazy, but you've got one. Rejoice. Re rejoice in your friends. Rejoice in your health. You go, oh, but pastor, I've got so many health problems. You're here. You're alive. Rejoice. Rejoice in your home. Oh, but I want a bigger home. You know what? The people in Puerto Rico right now would really be thankful for your home. 
So rejoice in your home. Rejoice in the comforts that you have. Rejoice in the food that you can eat. Rejoice in the fact that you have too much food to eat, and so you have to pay more to eat less food. That's what diet food's all about. We don't have the self-control for the smaller portions, so we pay more money and get them for us. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks in self-control. But, uh, but we got plenty of food. Lots of people in the world are hungry. We've got safety. We've got the reality that we live in the United States in 2017. And some of you are like, oh, but what about our country and this and that? And this? You know, look, we still live in the best country in the world. We're still free. We can rejoice in that. And besides that, hey, let's be honest. We live in Lake Havasu City. No hurricanes. No tornadoes. Uh, we can barely feel the earthquakes. And uh, let's be honest, there's no forecast for blizzards anytime soon. <laughs> so in other words, you can rejoice. If you can't rejoice in your blessings, we need to talk. Okay? And, and it goes beyond that. We can rejoice in the fact that, that God is redeeming us. He is working in your life. He is with you forever, no matter your failure, no matter the rebellion. God is at work to build your life for his glory. And if you rejoice in how God is redeeming you, you will be able to have patience for others that God is redeeming their lives to. Their failures, their mistakes, their betrayals, all that kind of stuff. If you recognize God's goodness and grace in your life and give thanks for that, you're going to be able to extend that grace to them. That's why we rejoice always. And if you want to be patient, rejoice more. And then remember. Remember. James chapter 5, just a couple of pages over. Verses 7 and 8. This is so clear, so, so listen to it. James says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. How long do we have to be patient? Until Jesus shows back up. That's it. That's as long. He says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains? You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. James reminds us that that God has won the victory. The coming of the Lord is at hand. So be patient. We win. The outcome is certain. Jesus has triumphed. If we're his followers, we share in his victory. And I talked extensively about this last week, so I'm not going to spend as much time on it. But, but understand that means that the pain, the frustration, the unmet expectations, the disappointments, the betrayals are all temporary. We cannot ruin God's victory by our failures, by our rebellion. And neither can the people that we're being impatient with. And if they can't ruin it and we can't ruin it, let's celebrate and let's remember that we win. And because we win, we don't have to get crazy upset over stuff that doesn't happen our way. So rejoice, remember, the hardest thing, Wait. Wait. It's hard for me. I want to get her done. I want to do stuff. I want to run and charge at it. And, and yet waiting is an incredible biblical theme. Listen to God's word. Just, just a few, uh, just a, a sampling. Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 40, verse 12, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He, he drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon the rock, making my steps secure. I waited patiently for the Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 31, But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. If we wait on the Lord. How about Romans 8, 23? And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, that anticipation of heaven, we wait patiently and eagerly for God to complete it. See, God wants me and you to wait on his power to wait on his wisdom, to wait on his timing. He's redeeming the world. Hey, let's be honest, God is redeeming us. 
And God's redeeming the people we love if we are patient and we are waiting. If we do not place our demands and, and we give them that opportunity to respond to the Holy Spirit of God. Now, when we talk about waiting, we're not talking about waiting passively. We're not talking about being spiritual couch potatoes who sit out on the couch, turn on the TV, put our feet up and go, okay, God, when you get it done, let me know. That's not waiting, that's just being lazy. Waiting means that we seek God. That, that, we, that we study, that we pray, that we look for those opportunities, that we are ready when God opens the door so that we can follow Him and, and we can take those steps that will lead to His redemption and demonstrate His power. Now you just heard a little bit ago Jill's story about her sister Sherry. And, and, and you know, I was with Jill in Thailand when, when God just kind of broke her heart and she said, you know what, I, I've got to make a difference in my family. My family's far from God and, and I want to, and yet she didn't have relationships, not healthy relationships. They weren't close as a family. They were scattered and broken and, and she began praying and waiting and, and reaching out gently and, and waiting and praying and, and she finally got three years later to that place where she said, I need to go and see my sister. And, and God opened the door, and she went, and she said, uh, I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to invite her to go with me. So gently, so, and, and, and she did that, and, and, and then she didn't demand that Sherry, like, right now, repent and do everything. She let God just bring her along, and, and months later, well, you heard the story. And now, because she waited on God, and she moved when God opened the door, and she was obedient, she and her sister experienced the power of God's grace. You see, God is committed to teaching us patience. God is committed to teaching you patience. Are you committed to learning patience? Are you committed to living patience? Because God wants to change your life and he is patient with you. Let's pray.